Good morning. It's so good to see you this morning. I'm glad you're here. And uh, of course, Brother Todd's taking the week off, and so he's asked me to preach, and it's always a privilege to be with you this morning. This morning, uh, I want to encourage you with a message that I've entitled, How to Be Used by God in Any Situation. And the reason I uh, asked Jerry to share that video uh, with you this morning was because it's, uh, it comes from a book that I read not too long ago, Captive in Iran. And if you're looking for a book to encourage you and at the same time challenge you in your faith, then let me encourage you to order that book. You can get that book off Amazon. But as you saw in the trailer, it's the story of how two women were arrested at the same time, two close sisters in Christ, and they were thrown in prison together in one of the most notorious prisons in Iran. And uh, there's a couple of things that stood out to me as remarkable about this story. Number one, the Iranian government made the mistake of arresting them together and then throwing them in prison together. You don't do that, especially if the charge is you're guilty of working together to glorify Christ's name and advance his kingdom. If they're doing that on the outside, what do you think they're going to be doing on the inside? The same exact thing. Well, not only that, but they're going to have each other to pray for each other, to hold each other accountable, to encourage each other when one is weak, the other is strong, and vice versa. But the thing that probably is most remarkable is some research that I came across just this week in studying for this message, and that's this. According to some research, the fastest growing evangelical movement in the world today is in Iran. And it's led mostly by women. Probably no surprise there because the Lord tends to use women the most, it seems, in the local church. But here's the encouraging thing about all that I'm telling you this morning and how it applies to your life today. I know both from experience, from what I've read in their book, and from what I read in the Bible that God can use anybody who is faithful to Him to advance His kingdom and to glorify His name. That means that God can use those two ladies. That means that God can use you here today. That means that God can use me as weak as I am, as broke as I am, as sinful as I am. Because ultimately, it is God who is working in and through us for the advancement of His kingdom and the glory of His name. He's done it before. He's doing it today. And this morning, I want to give you an example of that from Scripture. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. I love the book of Acts. If you ever want to be encouraged in your faith and, and you just want to, to read something in your Bible that's going to challenge you, go to the book of Acts. Of course, we know that the book of Acts is the story of how the Holy Spirit fills these new believers and the gospel begins to spread like fire. And it's not because of their education, it's not because of their talents or their gifts, but it's because of God's faithfulness to them. And let me tell you something, if God can use a bunch of fishermen like them, God can use you. God can use anybody, which is exactly why I want us to look at the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 25 down to verse 40. It's too lengthy of a passage, I think, this morning for us to just read together, but I'm going to break it down for you. Let me set up the context for you. Paul and Silas are on what's known as Paul's second missionary journey. Of course, in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council has just come together and they've met together to discuss the question, uh, how are Gentiles saved? Do they need to keep the law of Moses in addition to faith in Jesus? Or is it faith in Christ alone? And they come upon, they agree upon the decision that the new covenant is basically salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And so the Jerusalem council decides we're going to send Paul and Barnabas and another church leader by the name of Judas and Silas, who was a prophet, and we're going to send a few others, and they're going to go around and they're going to give this message to the churches. Well, Paul and Barnabas, they have a disagreement. You know, it is possible for church leaders not to agree on everything. So they have a disagreement, and they end up splitting. And don't you love how the Lord takes something that uh, 
probably was as a result of sin, uh, disagreement, and he ends up forming two missionary teams instead of one. And so Paul uh, takes Silas, Barnabas takes John Mark, uh, one team goes one direction, the other team goes in another direction, all for the same purpose of strengthening the churches and making disciples. Well, it's here in Acts chapter 16 that, that Paul and Silas, they're in Philippi, a Roman colony. Uh, Philippi got its name from uh, Philip of Macedon from the 8th century. That is Alexander the Great's father. And so it was a very important city. And they're walking through this city, and there's this slave girl who's walking behind Paul and Silas. But she's not quietly walking. She's, she's making a big scene. She's yelling at the top of her voice, and the Bible says that Paul gets greatly annoyed. And so he actually responds in love. You know what he does? He liberates this woman. He performs an exorcism, and the demon that was inside of this woman is released. That's good news, right? He just was used by God to transform someone's life, someone who had been held captive to Satan for her entire life. But it doesn't come across as good news because this slave girl was essentially being used and abused by her owners. She was able to tell the future. She was a fortune teller, and she was making these owners money. Well, whenever the demon left, she no longer can do that. The owners get upset, and they decide to have Paul and Silas flogged and arrested. And so the jailers come, and they take Paul and Silas, and they put them in this old, dusty dungeon, this prison, and the Bible says that they fasten their wrists and their feet in these stocks. Yet again, Paul and Silas in prison for simply being faithful, for simply being obedient to what God has for them. And it's in that dusty dungeon, it's in that dire and that difficult situation that God uses Paul and Silas to change the life of all people of one of the jailers, of one of the persecutors. And so, brothers and sisters, what I get from that story is simply this, that, that just like God can use these two men, and just like God can use those two women, God can use any two of you, or any one of you, because ultimately it is for God's glory, it is by God's grace, and by God's power. So, this morning, I have three propositions for you, three things that I want you to remember. If you want to be used by the Lord, if you want to be somebody that God can use in any situation, whether it's prison, whether it's sickness, whether it's your family, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, God can use you in any situation. Then remember these three propositions from the life of Paul and Silas. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Number one, learn to rest in the sovereign purposes of God. Learn to rest in his sovereign purposes. Look at verse 25, Acts chapter 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. Is that how you would expect two prisoners to respond in that situation? Let me ask you this. If you were in prison, is that how you would respond? I think that most people respond in worry, anxiety, probably in the corner somewhere in the fetal position, just scared out of their minds. Look, I don't know if Paul and Silas were scared or not. I don't know what kind of emotions they were experiencing. I mean, after all, they're only humans. It's, it's a natural thing to experience anxiety and fear. But in any, in any case, the way they respond is by trusting in God. Because it says that at midnight, instead of sleeping, and who can sleep in that situation anyways, the Bible says they are worshiping God. It says that they're praying and they're praising. And guess what? There are prisoners who are listening to them. Because there's people constantly watching you, wanting to see how you respond to the difficulties that God brings your way. Every difficulty in your life, every trial and every temptation is an opportunity for you to show the world that yes, this is hard, but I believe that God is in control. And that's exactly what Paul and Silas are doing. When you don't have anything to do, when you don't know what to do, here's what you should do. Pray to God and praise him for everything he's already done. Praise Him in advance for what He will do. Praise Him even when the situation is dark, difficult, and bleak because of who He is. 
Because even though, even though I don't understand what he's doing, even though I don't have all of the details, I know my God. I know his character. This isn't the first time I've been through something difficult. He's been there before. He will be there again. Paul knew that. Paul had experienced God's hand, God's provision before. And on top of that, he had Silas, a prophet with him. He had somebody there to encourage him and to remind him, we need those people in our lives. And we need to be reminded that God is sovereign and in control. You know, the Lord has a plan. He always has a plan and a purpose for everything, even when we don't understand what he's doing. It's not up to us to understand or to know all of the details, but we are commanded to trust in God because he is faithful. There's two truths that come through in this uh, concerning the sovereign purposes of God. Number one, the people in your life are not there by accident. The people in your life right now are not there by accident. You think it was an accident that both Paul and Silas went to prison together? You think it's an accident that all of these different characters that we're introduced to in Acts chapter 16 happen to come together in this way? If you read Acts chapter 16, you come across Paul, of course, Silas, this jailer, Timothy. We're introduced to Timothy for the first time in verses 1 through 5. Paul calls Timothy and, and he disciples him. He brings him along for the journey. We read of a, a businesswoman by the name of Lydia. The Bible says that Paul preaches to these women who are gathered for a prayer meeting. And the Bible says that God opens Lydia's heart to receive the word of the gospel. And she believes. We come across this slave girl. And, and again, over and over, we see examples of God bringing people so that he might have an impact on their life. This is not an accident. This is necessary help and divine appointments. And the same is true for you. God will bring people into your life for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. You might not enjoy their company always, but somebody might be there to get you in the right attitude, to get you in the right shape. In particular, there are four kinds of people that the Lord will bring into your life. Let me talk to you about these. Number one, uh, God will bring a Paul into your life. God will bring a Paul into your life. By that I mean a mentor, a teacher, a pastor, someone more experienced in the faith. Who is that Paul in your life? Who is that person that the Lord is bringing and putting over you so that you can learn from them? Number two, God will place a Barnabas or a Silas in your life. In other words, somebody that's there to encourage you. Somebody who's there to be a true partner in the faith. Somebody who's there to be a friend in the midst of difficulty, a Barnabas or a Silas. Number three, the Lord will bring a Timothy into your life. Remember that ultimately you and I are not called to simply learn and learn and learn and keep it to ourselves. Instead, we're to pass it on to others. And so a Timothy is a disciple or a younger person in the faith that God is calling you to encourage and to mentor and to teach them how to follow Jesus. And then last of all, God will bring a Lydia or a jailer into your life. Somebody who needs Jesus. Somebody who needs to know how to follow Christ. And God has placed them in your life so that you can share the gospel with them. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think about the people who are in your life, whether it's in your inner circle, your family, your, your work relationships, whatever it is. Everyone's there for a reason. No one is there by accident. God has brought them into your life for one of these four reasons. Take stock. Don't ignore the people in your life. They're there for a reason. But number two, not only has God uh, placed certain people in your life, but the circumstances that you are in, the situations that you face in your life, wherever you may find yourself today, that is not by accident. Things don't happen simply by chance or luck, or random occurrence, God is sovereign over them. So what happens as Paul and Silas are praying, and wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on the wall and heard the prayers of Paul? What do you think he was praying? What do you think he was asking God for? Do you think he was simply asking for deliverance? Do you think that he was asking for them to have an impact where they are? What do you think he was praying for? Well, look what happens in verse 26. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Do you think that that was a random earthquake? Do you think that it was accidental or by chance that at that very moment when Paul needed a breakthrough, there was a huge earthquake? So much so that the Bible says they were released, they were freed, the doors flung open, and even the prisoners had an opportunity to escape, but they didn't. Why didn't the prisoners leave? Because God ultimately was involved in this situation. I think about another time in the book of Acts where the Bible says that the apostle Peter was put in prison by Herod. Herod had actually just executed James. And Peter was put in prison, and by all indications, it seems as though Peter was next. But the Bible says it was not yet his time. The church made earnest prayer to the Lord for Peter. And while he was in prison, the Bible says that an angel from the Lord came and released Peter from jail. Again, angels just don't show up by accident or random occurrence. God was involved in this situation. And in the same way, this time it wasn't an angel, it was an earthquake. Either way, Peter and Paul were both put in prison for a reason. And as we're about to see, they were also released by God's provision, God's providence as well. What I'm trying to get you to see, what I'm trying to get you to understand this morning is this. Whenever you find yourself in a situation, it doesn't matter what it may be, uh, more than likely... Uh, it, it might not be prison, right? Whatever situation you might find yourself in, whether it's difficult or not, trust that God has a plan and God has a purpose for you right where you are. And God wants to use you. And I know it's easier said than done, but we've got to become the kind of people who learn to rest in God, who pray to God, who praise God in our situation because people are watching And whether it's persecution, temptations, difficulties, or trials, these are opportunities for us to trust in Him and to make much of God. To make much of God. So it's helpful to surround yourself with the right kind of people. The right kind of people to encourage you and to remind you and to help you in those times of difficulty. That's number one. Learn to rest in the sovereign purposes of God. Number two. Always be prepared to share your hope in Jesus. Always be prepared to share your hope in Jesus. What a great opportunity Paul has to share the message of Jesus. And watch what happens in verse 29. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What an opportunity. Here the the jailer is literally asking Paul to share the gospel with him. The jailer is scared out of his mind. There's no telling what kind of backstory this jailer has, how God had been working on him previously for him to even know to ask that question. Maybe he was listening to Paul and Silas. Maybe he had learned about God in, in some previous situation. But the truth is, he was looking He was searching, and he had asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Can I ask you a question? Number one, do you ever put yourself in situations where you even have the opportunity to tell someone who needs to know how they must be saved? Go back to that inner circle of yours. Do you need Christians in your life? Absolutely. We need Christians, both mature and those that we can pour into. But we also need unbelievers in our life who are going to need to know what they must do in order to be saved. We need people in our life so that we can share the answer to that question. But then number two, are you prepared? Are you equipped? Are you ready to make a defense or to give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus? Do you know what the gospel is? Do you feel capable, comfortable in articulating the answer to a question like that. 
And listen, I'm going to tell you something. We live in a day and a culture where not too many people are going to ask that kind of question. So maybe you need to ask them that question and then follow it up with a response. But the point is, all of us have been called. All of us have to be ready to share the hope that we have in Jesus. People need hope. There's people all around us today who are in desperate need of hope, and they're turning to all kinds of coping mechanisms. They're they're turning to drugs. They're turning to alcohol. They're turning to, to work and to money, to relationships. They're turning to all kinds of things. When in reality, none of those things are going to be helped them eternally. It might numb them temporarily, but we know that it's not until they come into a relationship with Jesus that they find this living hope. If you read Acts chapter 16, I encourage you to go home and do so. You'll see that Paul comes across uh, three different people, and after Paul comes across these three people, their lives are completely changed. After Paul shares the hope of Jesus with Lydia, the slave girl, and the Philippian jailer, the Bible says that their lives are turned upside down. They're completely changed and transformed. I I heard a sermon this week on Acts chapter 16, and they entitled it, Three Changed Lives. But the reality is, if you read closer, you, you come to see that it's more than three changed lives. Because just like the Philippian jailer, And just like Lydia, they took the gospel back home with them and their household came to faith in Christ. Their household believed as well. You know why? Because hope overflows. Hope is contagious. When you see someone with hope and you're looking for hope, you're attracted to that and you want some of that. So it's not three changed lives. It's even more so. But it all started with the faithfulness of one man or two men who were willing to share the hope that they have in Jesus. Okay, what's the answer to the question? What must I do to be saved? Look at verse 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. What an amazing encounter. Paul gives his response. And we don't have all of the response. I don't want you to think that all Paul said was verse 31 and and that was enough. and, and, And he was discipled and saved and he was encouraged in the faith. Because verse 32 gives us a pretty broad statement there. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. So, so we know that Paul had a tendency of preaching long uh, hours. Uh, he probably had a lot of conversation with the Philippian jailer and the household. But this is a pretty succinct, concise response to how must I be saved? What must I do to be saved? The gospel. Recognize that Jesus is Lord. That he is the creator of all things. He's not just another prophet or moral teacher. Jesus is the son of God. Recognize who Jesus is. The sinless and holy one. The fulfillment of all of the promises that were made to Israel. And then number two, repent of your sins. If Jesus is Lord, that means that you no longer get to call the shots. Jesus calls the shots. And it means that we're not We're not to live in our gross immorality and idolatry anymore. Instead, Jesus is our top priority. That's what it means to repent. It means to turn away from my idols and to make Jesus God. Recognize who he is, repent of your sins, and then receive him as Lord and Savior. Aren't you glad that Paul did not respond by saying, okay, here's a list of the Ten Commandments. And here's all the dietary laws and restrictions. And, and here's uh, some steps for you to follow. And by the way, we've got to talk about circumcision. We've got to talk about keeping the law. And, you, and you've got to talk about joining the synagogue and doing this and that. Paul didn't say that. He said, believe. Place your faith in Christ. Trust in him. Because he alone is sufficient to save. You can't do it. Jesus has already done it. It's the best news in all of the Bible that where you fall short, 
Jesus prevails. Where you fail, Jesus is victorious. Where you mess up, Jesus has paid it all. You recognize Him as Lord and as Savior. And that's why we have hope today. I have hope today because not of who I am, not of what I've done, but who Jesus is and what He's done on my behalf. People need to hear that hope. This man was literally suicidal. Do you see how he responded when he thought that all of the prisoners had escaped? He drew his sword, short dagger, and he was ready to kill himself. Paul was used by God in that moment to save his life physically and to introduce him to eternal life spiritually. Which tells us that we ought to be people who care about both. You care about people's lives holistically. Their physical lives as well as their spiritual lives. Why? Because you can't share the gospel with somebody who's not there. Whether literally or mentally or emotionally. We take care of their needs if possible. And then we, we share with them the hope of the gospel. Listen, I, I can help you temporarily. I can point you and meet your needs today and now, but I know somebody who can take care of your need eternally, your greatest need, your need for salvation. People are looking for hope. We have the answer. We have the answer to where our persecutors, our enemies, then become our brothers when they place their faith in Christ. Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you able Are you capable to tell someone about the hope that you have in Jesus? You should be. Do whatever necessary to get ready and then put yourself in the right situations. Rest in the sovereign purposes of God. He's in control. He has a plan. Number two, be ready. Be prepared to share the gospel. And then number three, keep the mission of God a top priority. Keep the mission of God a top priority. I don't think anybody would argue that Paul and Silas were not busy dudes. They were. They were, they were constantly busy. Again, Acts chapter 16 is a very busy portion of Scripture. Uh, in fact, Paul was wanting to go in different directions. He was wanting to go look for different opportunities. You know what Paul's heart was. Uh, the book of Romans uh, tells us that Paul wanted to take the gospel to places where Christ was not named. So he was constantly looking for places to share the gospel where the gospel had never been. Well, here is one of those opportunities. He's called to this specific region, and uh, he's put in prison. He's eventually released because the jailer gets saved. They let them go, and they tell him, we bid you farewell. We hope you are fine. And Paul isn't having it. Uh, He tells them in verses 35 through 39, hey, me and Silas, we're Roman citizens. You've broken the law in the way that you've treated us. We want the judges themselves, the top authorities, to come and to apologize to us. Well, why was Paul doing that? There's a couple of different reasons that people have suggested. Number one, Paul was holding them accountable and seeking justice. That may very well be the answer. Number two, you've got to think about what potentially has just happened. Uh, It's very possible that this is the origin. This is the birth of the church at Philippi. You know that in your New Testament, there's an actual letter that Paul ironically writes from jail again to the place where he was once imprisoned. And so how did that church start? Very likely, this is the beginning of that church with Lydia and some of those women, perhaps with the slave girl. We're not necessarily told that she was saved, but she was liberated. I would want to know how that happened. And if I found out that it was because of Jesus that I was liberated, I might end up giving my life to him. So she probably did get saved. Luke doesn't tell us that, but we certainly hope so. And then finally, the Philippian jailer. So there you have the birth of this new church. And what Paul is probably doing here, he's securing the safety and the security and the establishment of those believers. They're associated with Paul. The magistrates and the authorities respect Paul. Therefore, we can get this church moving. You see, the Apostle Paul had a lot of things. He was very busy. But his top priority was always the local church. The Apostle Paul had a passion for the people that Jesus 
had a passion for. Jesus has a passion for his church. Jesus has a passion for his people. Look at how the, the, the passage finishes in verse 40. And the Bible says, So they went out of the prison, and they visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, and then they departed. Don't you just love that? Paul was so busy, but he wasn't too busy to go and to check back on the new believers, to go and to check on the new converts and to strengthen them. And if you read throughout the book of Acts, you see this pattern over and over again of Paul caring about the condition of the local church. Look at verse 5 of Acts 16. It says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Paul cared about his local church. To him, the people of God were his top priority. Because he remembered the Great Commission, which was Jesus' final command to his disciples, to the apostles, go into all the world and make disciples. Jesus did not simply say, make converts, make new Christians. He said, make disciples, followers of Christ, who will then show others how to follow Christ. Our top priority as believers should simply be sharing Jesus, making disciples, strengthening the churches, and loving people. It's a simple formula. It's not easy at times. Why? Because we're dealing with people. I'm hard to deal with. Y'all are hard to deal with. But if Jesus deals with us, I think we can try by His grace and for His glory. And it looks different for everybody. Again, we talk about the Apostle Paul and how busy he was, a tent maker by trade, a church planner, an apostle, a disciple maker. He was all of these things, but he kept his priorities in check. He loved the people of God. And we ought to love each other as well, strengthening the churches by making disciples. Brothers and sisters, I'm zealous to be used by God. I'm so imperfect. I'm so broken. But I'm zealous to be used by God. And I know that he can because if God used them, then God can use me. And if God can use me, then God can certainly use you. May he do so today for his glory. Will you pray for me, with me? Oh, Father in heaven, we come to you so thankful and encouraged, God, by the example of Paul and Silas and how you use them to change life after life after life. Lord, it would be such a tragedy to, to walk away thinking, well, of course he used Paul and Silas. They're Paul and Silas. The only reason you used them was because they were willing to be faithful to you. God, may we have that same heart, that same passion and desire to be faithful to you, to, to, to believe that you can use us despite us broken as we are, sinful as we are, messed up as we are, God, you will use us for your glory and for the spread of the gospel. Thank you, God, for the hope that we have in you to believe in Jesus, to receive Jesus, the forgiveness of sins and salvation. Lord, help us to share that with others, to care about each other, and to make disciples. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.